Dr. Pradeep De Costa. He is the uh, in charge uh, ICU with us. So we'll come to case two directly. Okay, he's here. Yes. Welcome, Dr. De Costa. So we'll start with the first case. So I have uh, I purposefully put unstable patient because all of the, not all of these patients are hemodynamic and unstable. They may be unstable otherwise. So first case is a 28-year-old man who had who had an accident with where a, uh, a blunt trauma to abdomen after a stone wall collapsed on him. He came with distended and tender abdomen. He had guarding. He was anuric for eight hours. He had received about two liters of normal saline at the time of evacuation. Still on admission, BP was 90, with respiratory rate of 26. He was tachycardic. His CVP was four that time. Fluid uh, resuscitation was continued, and dopamine infusion did not improve the outcome. So we did CT, which uh, the patient was unfortunate to have only one kidney, and uh, there was a laceration of the artery and the artery was not uh, visualized in the CT. There was splenic lacerations and multiple lacerations of the body and tail of pancreas. So he was taken for exploratory laparotomy. There was hemoperitoneum noted. Anterior abdominal wall necrosis was there. There were widespread retropinal fat, uh, fat necrosis and uh, liquefaction of the jejunal wall as well as pancreatitis. And splenic laceration was also found which was repaired. So he underwent desluffing, necrosectomy, of the pancreas, drain insertion there, splenectomy and feeding jejunostomy. So uh, kidney was left on its own. Postoperatively, he received antibiotics, noradrenaline, intravenous fluids, and elective ventilation was done. POD3, he suddenly had bleeding from the peritoneal drain. HB fell to 2.6, platelets for 47,000. There was DIC. Despite transfusions, he developed shock went to cystic uh, systolic and cardiac arrest. He was revived with that. And now he's on norad plus vasopressin. His pH is 7, bicarb is 7.3, urea of 147, uh, 167 and creatinine of 7.3. He's anuric, he has hyperkalemia and uh, he has pulmonary edema also. So we'll come to the questions so for Dr. Ricosta. How much fluid should an aneuric patient uh, should receive, keeping in mind the pulmonary edema and how it should be monitored? With respect to this particular case or in or general? even any, in general case. So uh, in respect to this particular case, I feel that initially you had a person who was given two liters of uh, fluid yes. and after that he stabilized, then somehow down the line he destabilized. So even though I think you mentioned an X-ray which shows a pulmonary edema, I think we require to assess various other parameters as well to decide on the fluid status. I would not take anuria as a common indication for stopping okay. fluids, which is done commonly. People feel that anuric patients, you cannot give any fluids. But in this particular patient, I feel he will require fluids definitely. Yes. The parameters I would watch for are bedside echocardiography and a good echodynamic study that would include measuring his IVC diameter and looking at the variations, not a static value, the variations. We would probably do a passive leg raising test in him under ultrasound guidance and if the diameter increases by 13% or so after PLR, it means he could be fluid depleted. Now, all said and done with your picture of pulmonary edema, there are chances that this person could have an IVC which is on the larger side. So in that case, there's still some controversy in fluid management. In that case, we would look at his left ventricular outflow tract, velocity time integrals. And that tracing looks exactly like an arterial line tracing. If you find variations more than 15%, that person is fluid depleted. Of course, in addition to this, we look at his lungs, look for the presence of B lines and A lines. If you find the lungs predominantly A lines, or no increase, B lines means wet lungs, means more fluid in the lungs, and A lines means dry lungs. So if you get a profile which has more A lines despite giving fluids, 
that person can take more fluids. And if you get a profile which shows progressively increasing B lines as you give fluid, it means that fluid is probably leaking into the lungs and you have reached the end point of your fluids. Then, uh, The uh, abdomen, if there's a raised intra-abdominal pressure, the IVC diameter can be fallacious. And hence, we should not go on to only one diameter. We should do even the left ventricular outflow tract, VTI, and look at the uh, lungs as well to make an assessment of fluids. And repeated measurements will help. Uh, one measurement. simple measurement, which is often neglected, is this patient has now been in the hospital for three or four days. Yes. So his cumulative balance and weight should be looked at. Yes. Now, cumulative balance means all the intakes which are given, uh, parenteral and enteral, if there is enteral, I think, suspect. Th this patient this had a feeding jejunostomy, so some amount there. And all the outputs, which would include urine output, the drains which are there, and other things. So just a, cumul a simple cumulative balance can give us some idea because there were studies which showed that when your cumulative fluid balance goes more than 10% of the weight at admission, mortality starts to increase. No, you need to have weighing beds. weighing beds. In a patient like this, you'll need to have a weighing bed. And even ideal body weight can be calculated by measuring the length of the patient. So, uh, for Dr. Dico, uh, for Dr. Lobo, how do we ensure that all medications and all the nutrition that patient needs, without compromising the circulation and ventilation, yeah. so we need to restrict the fluid also and give yeah. that much. So of here is a patient who is anuric, so is not going to pass urine. His creatinine, as you showed us, is already seven. So there isn't any real role for using diuretics in this patient. He had a single kidney which with an uh, with thrombosed artery. So he's going to stay anuric because that's probably an infected single kidney now. He's going to he's going to be hypercatabolic with all the infections and other things that he's got. So the minimum sort of fluid, even if he can be fed through the jejunal stomach, to give him 30 calories per kg or more is going to be 1 to 1.2 liters. Mm -hmm. If it's total parental nutrition, it could go as high as 2 liters that he is receiving. He is going to need blood products. I saw that his hemoglobin was 2.6. He's got DIC. So he'll get blood products to the tune of another 700 to 800 ml. He's getting noradrenaline and vasopressin and the noradrenaline dose is 0.5 micrograms per kg. So he's going to get, those two drips are going to add, even with syringe drivers, around 25 ml per hour. That's 600 ml in the day. And he's going to get his antibiotics as infusion. So this patient is going to get 2 to 2.5 liters of obligatory intake in the course of 24 hours, and he's anuric. So this patient probably needs to initiate renal replacement therapy to ensure that his nutrition and medications don't suffer. So, uh, yeah, in this case, it is it is clear that we have to initiate RRT. But what would be other indications of initiating RRT? Uh, uh, in an AKI, it's usually as in a CKD test. But again, the uremia matters less in AKI, but it's only the electrolyte disturbances, volume, mm -hmm. and how much you need to require to give the fluid yeah. for nutrition, antibiotic, and that should be taken care. So you need to have this patient as high, a severe acidosis, hyperkalemia is there and volume overload is in pulmonary edema. You need to give almost two and a half to three liter. Already patient is pulmonary edema. You may need to make a volume so that you can infuse and give fluid. So uh, electrolyte disturbances in the form of acidosis, hyperkalemia, which is not correctable, volume overload. And if there is any pericarditis, all other things are there that also they require initiation. So. And uh, we have Rakesh in audience, and his thesis showed that majority of the patients require dialysis because of the fluid overload. Fluid overload. Yes. Earlier also people used to say give more fluid. Now better is drier the lung, yes. better is. But again, you need to take care. Yes. The yes. hypotension also won't yes. activated yes. just by pu pulling out more water. Yes. And that brings us to the next question, sir. What are the goals of RRT in a critically ill patients, and what are in uh, intensivist perspective on that? I, I think the question has already been partially yes. answered. Yes. So the goals would be similar and uh, the nephrologist and intensivist are on the same page yes. in the goals of management of uh, critically ill patients. Yes. But I would put a cautious point. I would say we divide the goals into maybe two subsets. One in a patient who has comorbidities. Uh, this would include persons with probably diabetes, low ejection fraction, elderly, previous strokes. 
maybe on anticoagulants. Mm -hmm. This is one group of patients which I would put as a high risk group. And another patient which is young, maybe who has had a rhabdo and just gone into an a renal because of that. That would be a relatively straightforward management decision. But the complicated case would involve a multidisciplinary approach and then we would take a team call on the management. Again, the goals would be same. We would look at fluid management, electrolyte homeostasis, assess like Dr. Lobo said, the volume. We tend to overdo the volume, so then we decide on what volume and what dilutions the antibiotics should be given and how the nutrition should be supplemented to these patients. All these are team decisions which we do together. Fashion, is it? I mean, in fluid management, I hardly see people putting in a Schwangans catheter. We do it once a year to show our students. <laughs> <laughs> but, but most, because they ask the waveforms of Schwangans in the exam still for some particular reason. But most of the information or all the information you can get by the bedside transthoracic, not even a transesophageal. You can even measure the wedge pressure, you can measure the lung water. You can look at the effect of fluid challenges over time just by looking at the uh, ecodynamics at the bedside. And even the APQ and these sort of uh, uh, new instruments which have come in, some of them have some limitations because some of them do not give you the lung water. And most of our controversies come when it is respect to lung water and fluids. So again, the ultrasound scores. I'm biased towards ultrasound. But <laughs> Sir, uh, most of these patients will have lactic acidosis uh, and lactate uh, actually is associated with uh, higher lactate levels are associated with mortality. So what is the role of lactic acidosis in hemodynamic instability? So basically lactate causes more and more acidosis and it is cardiosuppressant. So it will further reduce the cardiac output and also it's a vasodilator and it causes more vasodilatation in the artery and even the vein. So pooling of the blood occurs, further uh, hypotension. And these patients are less responsive to even the inotropes because of the effect on the smooth muscles, the contractility goes down. So they are very difficult to manage even with increasing doses of inotropes and your va vasoconstriction will not be there. Unless you correct your primary abnormality of hyperperfusion to the tissues, it is not going to improve and it increases the mortality. All papers have shown more than five millimoles and has more and more mortality. So how do we can tackle lactic acidosis? Can I, can I just ask, the, because you've got a very nice panelist, there is a constant controversy while we are having this lactic acidosis of whether ringer lactate should be used as an IV fluid. So what is your take on that? Yeah. So like Dr. Hegde said, that's in fact the question here, that ringer lactate works by giving a load of lactate which is converted to bicarbonate by the Krebs cycle in the liver. If your liver is not perfused well or if you have liver dysfunction, if you have shock liver, then that lactate is not going to be metabolized. So you're going to get an additional load of lactate which is going to worsen the situation. If the liver function is good, it is fine. The other thing is, if you have liver dysfunction, but your muscles are perfused well, you can use Ringa acetate because acetate is preferentially converted to bicarbonate in the muscles as opposed to lactate which requires the liver. One of the misconceptions, that's the question that he had over there, is that we would do dialysis to remove lactate because lactate is a small molecule. The load of lactate that develops in hypoperfused or ischemic tissues is so large that there is no form of renal replacement therapy that can clear lactate efficiently. There is a study, it's a case report actually reported 2015 or 2016 in ACKD, where they used two CRRT machines simultaneously on the same machine with femoral cannulae in each, uh, on, on each side, and they gave 120 mil milliliters per kilogram per hour of dose of CRRT, and still the lactate could not be cleared. So tissues, well-perfused tissues, will remove lactate much faster than any form of renal replacement therapy. So what is the role of renal replacement therapy? SLED or uh, conventional dialysis 
can give a large dose of bicarbonate to buffer the H ions which accompany the lactate. So what you end up by doing is decreasing the H ions, quickly bring down the metabolic acidosis which may improve cardiac function. Now imagine there is a patient whose blood pressure is 90 by 60, has a lactate of 4.5 and is 95 by 60 lactate of 4.5 and is on noradrenaline vasopressin like this patient. What you already have is a mean arterial pressure of 72. The target mean arterial pressure is more than 65. But as soon as we see six, uh, 95 systolic, the tendency is to increase the noradrenaline or increase the vasopressors. When you increase the vasopressors, you cause more vasoconstriction and actually hypoperfused tissues more and the lactate increases. So even if you've dialyzed the patient, even if you've temporarily corrected the acidosis, if you don't bring down the pressors, keeping in mind that it is the mean arterial pressure that determines tissue perfusion and not the systolic pressure, the lactate will increase and as the lactate increases you will get a rebound acidosis sometime later and again the blood pressure will fall. Now when the blood pressure falls, the vasopressors will be pushed, we'll have to push up the vasopressors further, we'll get a transient rise in the blood pressure but at the cost of still more lactate and a vicious cycle develops. So the aim would be quick buffer with a form of renal replacement therapy, correct the metabolic acidosis and then target the lowest possible main arterial pressure at which the lactate is falling rather than rising. Yeah, even with a dehydrated patient, I need, if there is an effective intravascular volume is poor and you are increasing the noradrenaline, it will do more harm rather than benefiting the patient. So that's what Dr. DeGosta said about volume management volume. at this time. You have to optimize both volume and pressors and look at the lactates. All ABGs give us lactates, but what is tends people tend to look at is pH, bicarbonate, carbon dioxide. So if the lactate can be looked at with every ABG, it's a valuable clue to show what is happening at the tissue level. So a progressive rise in lactate despite optimal therapy means a poor prognosis. A poor prognosis. <laughs> and, the, and the liver is being perfused. Organ dysfunction. Most of them are hypoperfused. They can have subtle liver dysfunction as well as renal dysfunction. We don't know those who are having obvious uh, liver disease. That is, uh, they are different. But those who are uh, to start with, they were normal. They had multi-organ failure, severe septic shock. They can have subtle liver dysfunction. In those cases, what should be the take? Because they can have you some impairment of the re liver function as well. So we so don't you, know to you what don't, extent. Yeah. So you, do, you would prefer to avoid lactate in some... It is fact that for that reason that uh, Gambro and others have replaced their acetate and lactate buffered replacement fluids with bicarbonate buffer yes. now. And in fact, we had it in one of your patients some years ago yes. who had occult liver disease and we did regional citrate anticoagulation. And we found that metabolic acidosis with a high anion gap developed while the patient was on CRRT, and that was because of citrate accumulation. So citrate, like lactate, is converted into bicarbonate in the liver. So if liver function is not there, then that citrate causes a high anion gap acidosis. So every textbook tells you, you citrate causes alkalosis. But if the liver function is not good, it will cause metabolic acidosis. Yes. You need to measure serially the citrate in this yeah. patient. Again, the uh, modern ABG machines show us anion gap. So I have found that the uh, rising anion gap is of earlier indicator than the citrate ionic calcium of uh, uh, citrate accumulation. Okay. So what modality and we can discuss it throughout the day and still will say that any modality will be uh, useful. So the patient should receive some form of dialysis. It will be an individualized choice for the patient as well as for the consultant. So what are the difficulties in delivering RRT to patients who need high pressures? Uh, I don't think anybody knows the answer because uh, you've got to, in a patient like this, there's pulmonary edema, so we've got to do some ultrafiltration. We know the patient is going to get two and a half liters of uh, fluid obligatory. There's nothing we can do about that. Blood products, uh, nutrition, pressors, etc. And the patient, so now this is the really the most difficult thing. If you do too high an ultrafiltration rate, you're going to end up by producing hypotensive episodes, more lactic acidosis. If you do too little ultrafiltration, 
then what you will end up with is pulmonary edema worsening, worse, uh, increasing ventilatory settings, more hypoxia, again more hypoxia, more lactic acidosis. So it's a tough situation. There are two retrospective studies which looked at what is the optimal ultrafiltration rate. Well, both are done by Ravin, Raghavan Murugan and John Kellum, published in 2018 and 2019, in which they looked at uh, CRRT studies from the renal study. And this, it seemed that the optimum ultrafiltration rate is 1 to 1.75 ml per kg per hour. When you go more than that, the mortality increased. When you went less than that, the mortality increased. Mm -hmm. So it was, you do too little ultrafiltration, mortality increases because fluid, accumul fluid overload. You do too much, you produce hypotension and again the mortality. So there's a typical J-shaped curve of biological phenomena with regard to ultrafiltration rates. It is equivalent to the refilling rate, possibly? We, yeah, the thing is, the refilling rate, we know it in our conventional CKD patients that you can go 10 to 12 ml per kg per hour. But in the ICU patient whose capillaries are leaky, who has got glycocalyx dysfunction, who's on vasopressors, I don't think anybody in the world, I couldn't find any literature that said what is the vascular refilling rate in such patients. So uh, some, some part of the, uh, this answer actually came up that how do we balance ventilation and circulation when uh, in a patient who is needing pressors and also ultrafiltration? So uh, on ventilation, uh, there are now standard strategies of probably low volume uh, ventilation and protective lung strategies which have to be applied. I think this is a standard strategy which I applied. What Dr. Lobo correctly said, the trick is how to get the CRRT machine or the renal replacement going and that is a big trick because if these patients are on multiple presses it's an extremely challenging job for the whole team to hold on to the mean arterial pressure plus ensure that the fluid is removed at the same time and that's a I don't think there's a clear answer to that it has to be patient based and individual case based and in addition to this uh, there has to be a lot of concentration on the antibiotics which go in timing of the antibiotics which are also going to be crucial to the outcome. A lot of thought has to be given to the blood products which are given during all these sessions. And also I think if you decide to give albumin, when it has to be given, how it has to be given and how it has to be delivered. I think these are very, very crucial in this particular uh, aspect which covers both the ventilation and the circulation. It is preferable to have invasive devices in place. So we prefer to have an arterial line in place when you have a very, very high risk dialysis going to be done. This is despite whatever coagulopathy the patient has. So ultrasound guided lines are relatively safe and you can avoid most of the complications if you do them guided in the ICU. I have a uh, slight uh, corollary to your earlier comment. And there was a lot of controversy about use of colloids. Yeah. So is there any uh, new uptake or new... On there the are 30 studies on starches and a meta-analysis. And at the end of it, the results are inclusive. But there are some... Uh, there's enough evidence to say that starches are better avoided if there is uh, uh, something better that can. You made a very good point about albumin. If you are doing CRRT, it's fine. You can give your albumin at any time because there's continuous ultrafiltration over 24 hours. If you are doing SLED or intermittent hemodialysis, the albumin needs to start before you start your dialysis. It needs to go on while the dialysis is going on and it needs to end and there has to be a, at least two to three hours more of ultrafiltration after that because vascular refilling is going to continue during that time. So what contributes to hypotensive episodes during dialysis? So one is your ultrafiltration, rate of ultrafiltration again, mm -hmm. Dr. Lobo said we don't know the refilling rate in these patients because they are all uh, leaky capillaries, so they leak and you have to reverse whatever is amount, you are going to ultrafiltration, what you are doing is reducing the effective intravascular volume. So very difficult to decide whether it is depleted or if you are dialyzing with the same uh, things like uh, if the infusion lines are also you are having a triple line and you are infusing with the middle and you are dialyzing, then you are removing all the noradrenaline okay. and vasopressin. So it is hazardous. You need to have a separate line for that and then you can avoid removal of these vasopressors. Mm -hmm. So uh, 
uh, and is there any bleeding which is happening because of the anticoagulation what you are giving mm -hmm. and even the lung also leads to hypoxia during the dialysis there may be more, more or more neutrophilic uh, things and then clogging hypoxia which may further reduce the oxygenation to the heart and even stunning myocardium is one of the things when you do ultrafiltration or dialysis which people have shown that the troponin increases and even so uh, the, that also may contribute to it but uh, in a nutshell, those who have a hypoalbinemic, severely septic, on inotropes, difficult to decide the rate of ultrafiltration, and it is you have to uh, balance between the hydration and uh, uh, actual water okay. content and the ultrafiltration resistance has to be balanced. Okay. So how do we prevent hypotension on dialysis? Yeah. So again, uh, we've had a fair amount of discussion on this. The key is probably the ultrafiltration rate. If we can know what ultrafiltration rate the patient will tolerate, which we have to individualize, then that would prevent. In a very unstable, like your index case, two pressors, three pressors, we might st severe acidosis, hyperkalemia, we might start without ultrafiltration. We might try to correct the hyperkalemia and acidosis, hope that the blood pressure improves with that and that we can then do some amount of ultrafiltration. There are a whole lot of other things. One can keep a cool dialysate, so current machines can drop the temperature down to about 35. Mm -hmm. On 5008, it goes down to 34. So 34 degrees centigrade dialysate, there's evidence that that helps. Sodium profiling, controversial. Higher sodium dialysates probably will help, but at the cost of accumulating sodium, increasing the osmolality of the blood. Higher calcium dialysates to improve myocardial function have been used, but there is really small evidence for all these interventions, and the key will be individualizing and closely monitoring. So how do we treat that hypotensive? I process? think the answer was uh, given probably by yes. Do. I would say we should not want to treat too many hypotensive episodes. We should be able to preempt and find the situation where they are about to happen. And if you are monitoring, and I would say monitoring of the patients is the key to preventing hypotensive episodes. Because so many times findings are missed, so many times parameters, for example, a pulse of 140 is going down to 190. Mm -hmm. These things are missed. A BP of which was 140 systolic suddenly comes to 100 systolic. It is taken as normal by some person. These points have to be picked up, I think, before they happen. Because once they happen, you probably have already missed the bus. And you should have acted a little bit before by involving the nephro team and getting the settings changed, maybe reducing the ultrafiltration rate for a few hours or whatever, and then re-coming to the rates which you were once the stabilization has happened. Once the destabilization happens, it's a nightmare then to tackle the destabilization. So when do we stop ultrafiltration? during the session. So once it's already hypotension yes. is persistently progressive, the thing is we need to have good hydration stated. So we need to dialyze only. So the ultrafiltration, you can stop it. Dialyze for one hour, see how the hemodynamic stability is there. Then you can restart because you're doing an ultrafiltration, your blood pressure is dropping, your perfusion to the tissues is going to stop. The thing in, in a serious patient who is on a multiple inotropes, your main is acid correction and electrolyte balance. And if you're able to maintain the saturation, he's already on a ventilator. So a uh, little bit wet lung also may create a problem. But again, uh, hypotension, the perfusion pressures, the continuously ongoing lactate, whatever modality, you may not be able to uh, reverse it. So the ultrafiltration temporary we can start. Once it improves, you can start with a little less dose of ultra, less level of ultrafiltration. Then you will be able to go ahead. So we can skip this second question, which is already answered actually. So what are the consequences of circuit clotting? So the consequences of circuit clotting are that you lose snail covered part of it yesterday, that you will lose a large volume of blood, blood suddenly. So we worry about your patient bleeding and so we avoid anticoagulation. We have to balance out the risk of a occult bleed somewhere due to the anticoagulation that we are using versus a circuit suddenly clotting and the patient will lose about 200 ml, 150 to 200 ml of blood minimum when the circuit clots in that situation. So fortunately, if with CRRT, regional citrate anticoagulation, if it can be used, is a good thing. And with SLED, we are fairly good at doing SLED without anticoagulation now and still not losing the circuit. So the consequence of uh, clotting is that the patient is going to lose 200 ml of blood, which is a big volume. So in this case, we started with CRRT, then switched to SLED. 
in between he required uh, uh, inotropes, pressors, and uh, then received various antibiotics including M4. Uh, then finally he was stable and he was discharged with perm care uh, to be put on maintenance dialysis. So this is case two. This you is want to do this case? case two. We'll do it. This is uh, a maintenance dialysis patient. He's a 52-year-old diabetic and hypertensive. He's on uh, maintenance dialysis since two years. Had AVF, but which clotted about one month back, and now he's on perm cath. He was dialysing uh, thrice a week, and he's getting hypotension on every dialysis. Interdialytic weight gains are 2 to 2.5 kg. Starting BP is 170, and he gets hypotension by about end of one hour. And maximum UF that we can achieve is 1.5 kg. And he's 2 kg above his state dry weight. Has 1 plus edema. BP is still 104 by 74. So chest is clear and uh, x rays doesn't uh, show any fluids in the lungs. But his echo shows ejection fraction of 20%, dilated LV, and global hypokinesium. Coronary angio was done and showed triple vessel disease and is advised CABG. So what modality of maintenance RIT should this patient go for? Uh, he's getting hypotension at. <laughs> so basically, uh, you require a so long continuous. So possibly CAPD may be a better option. But again, if he has an already an ascites, then doing a CAPD may be counterproductive because you may drain more water and he may get dehydrated and persistent. Otherwise, with a low ejection fraction, continuous process, uh, CAPD may be better. Or a six hours or eight hours of sled in this patient, uh, even if there is no access or CAP till the CAPD he is healing because he is already a 20% ejection fraction, CKD. And even the, if you put a uh, CAPD line, and if he, if he don't heal, if he leaks, then the healing process also leaks time. So till the CAPD catheter heals daily, possibly five to six hours, low ultrafiltration can be done. Only isolated ultrafiltration or a sequential dialysis, because he may not require so much of dialysis. So you can do six hours or eight hours, four hours of sequential ultrafiltration and dialysis, because long du duration with a low flow of ultrafiltration may be beneficial. Again, whether the CABG will benefit him if there is any uh, no significant scarring, the perfusion to the heart improves, even heart function will improve. So whether we need to ask the cardiologist whether uh, with a grave risk, basically 20% if you're doing it, and it will be very difficult to manage post-operatively. And uh, so if the perfusion improves, then the heart function all improves, the blood pressure may also improve. So how do, he's not ready to be. CABD, you have to grade it. You need to not do a lot of ultrafiltration. Completely don't drain it. Uh, you, you have to you have put two liters, 2.5 liters or 2.7. You stop it. Sir. Don't remove completely. So gradually, if some somebody gradually. is on dialysis uh, ascites, dialysis related ascites, uh, we had one such patient. We gradually reduce the intra abdominal uh, volume, and uh, we could uh, successfully uh, manage the patient for almost two years. No. You will have to do it gradually. If yes, sir. Put it gradually. If completely drains, you will have more and more yes, sir. Yes, coming sir. up. So it is great. Initially, we just kept, kept the dwell time 500. Correct. Used to ensure that lady uh, remains there with at least 3 liters of fluid because she had accumulated almost 7 liters of intra abdominal fluid. Sir. That's the point he's making that, sir. that 7 liters should not be drained over Drain the first day or two. Can, you can make it 1 to 1.5 liters negative because he will be taking 800 to liter negative. So every day you make him around 500 ml negative. Sir. So then only you will be able to at least the perfusion or the refilling rate will be things. Otherwise, if you do it 2 liters negative, he is not achieving 1.5 liters yes. also. So you can't make more than 1.5 liters negative. negative. Even though it is 4 hours, mm -hmm. even 24 hours you can do it, then it will be more stable. Because one hypotension episode is going to further cause the cardiac uh, perfusion fever and is going to have more and more damage. Sir, uh, one, of one uh, query uh, slightly related to this. In such patients, uh, uh, how safely can we give digoxin just to improve in CKD patient, just to improve? Because I've been using it 0 0.0.125 alternate day and patients have shown phenomenal response. After five days or alternate day. Uh, sir. 
though it's got a narrow therapeutic window but i think it works i agree with you it's a forgotten drug it works beautifully yes but sir. but don't don't avoid hypo hypokalemia in this patient so yes sir. yes hypokalemia yes so midotrin can be used persistently he is having I mean, antisystolic and lb function is poor only you can do during the dialysis is a short duration after that he is going to have again hypo hypotension midotrin is a vasoconstrictor it will help you transiently but in the long run as he said a patient with an ejection fraction of 20% with triple vessel disease midotrin is going to increase the afterload and put still more of a load on the heart in the long run so maybe to achieve to a couple of hd sessions to get the patient ready for cabg perhaps but not in the long run it's better for those patients who are getting uh, hypotension because of autonomic neuropathy they do well with midotrin dr manitol is an aneuric then he may have problem so you can you can people people used to use albumin or manitol even people use manitol in us or in europe they use urea to expand it so people are using it but again it's a temporary measure every day you are every dialysis you are giving a manitol manitol it will accumulate and he will have a pulmonary edema because manitol takes lot of time to clear in in those patients who are renally poor so one day two days is okay every day it it's a big problem so uh, we'll come to the next question that is iso uf and yes what is your take on sodium propylene yes we are coming to that and second thing uh, sodium profiling will help in this case sodium profiling may help but initially every time in the one after one hour he is getting it so how long you do it you have to reduce your sodium even it may help you in the initial time increasing the sodium but at the end if you keep a high sodium he is going to drink more water and your uh, more and more uh, vascular uh, uh, retention of fluid so it's going to expand create a problem already the ejection fraction is very poor so in such patients you may try it but again it it is uh, it looks very good but in a patient it won't work and online sodium profiling it was available i think in arrt plus machine The, uh, no online plus is not online sodium profiling it is online clearances now we are using that it's available in all the ng machines also that you put the ocm on which gives you an idea of the patient's plasma sodium and so you can set your profile as per what is the patient so like instead of uh, using a standard sodium which is 136 and then adding a profile in which you start with 140 and end with about 134 if you know that that patient keeps coming to dialysis with a sodium of 130 in fact that's vipul sangvi's thesis at the present at present using the online clearance uh, monitor sodiums to individualize dialysis sodium in patients so it may help there is one study from cmc velor which has looked at it and uh, there are the biofeedback uh, sodium profiling is available with the equilibrium device in some of the machines which haven't yet come to india so those uh, have shown that we using biofeedback and sodium profiling works much better than setting standard sodium profiles but that equilibrium device hasn't yet come here that measures actual blood sodiums here the online clearance that we are using is extrapolating the plasma sodium from the dialysate sodiums so we'll go to next case this is just a 2 minute case and and we won't be discussing it much she is a uh, 40 kg lady who is on dialysis is not used to the fluid restrictions because she's just started on dialysis comes with 3 kg weight gain and before dialysis 180 bp while dialysis started at 30 minutes bp went up to 220 she's breathless her saturation dropped to 84 and the technician phones you keep, should i stop dialysis so what will you do anybody from the audience stop dialysis or not stop dialysis? what problem she is getting problem any better answer can combine these two so to continue dialysis as well as the nitroglycerin drip okay Yes. So message. Is, 
Yes. So message is that. The message do is not that. stop. Don't stop. These patients have gone over the top of the Frank Stalling curve. So you continue ultra filtration. You can put them in isolated ultra filtration if you're worried that the dialysate sodium is contributing to that hypertension on dialysis. But don't stop because this patient is going in palmedema. So continue ultra filtration, whatever you do. Adding a AS inhibitor ERP will be better. It is like yeah. a in the long run, in maybe. the long run. The, the situation that he faced is typically everyone's scared, saturation is dropping, BP is going through the roof. The simplest thing seems to be take the patient off dialysis because they are worsening on dialysis. The answer is don't do it. You may use BiPAP, you may use everything, but don't stop the dialysis, don't stop the ultrafiltration, whatever you do. We control the blood pressure and continue ultrafiltration. Yes, so we can uh, continue if, even with iso -era, if you are worried about the sodium load. Uh, actually, in this case, this particular case, we continued dialysis. We had NTGO on board. And in addition, we applied uh, BP cuffs to all four limbs to reduce the venous return also. And we were able to carry on for next half an hour to get the ultra filtration. And I see the problem in this patient is not entirely. It's not the only fluid. It's the blood pressure. So you get the BP down, whatever happens. Use NTG, use labetalol, get the BP down, and I am telling you half the problem. Even if you continue ISO, you have the BP will BP come down. down. Yeah, but you ha don't have that much time. You see, the problem is this is a sudden acceleration of blood pressure, and which has caused problems. Get the blood pressure down, I am telling you half the problems will get solved. I agree. Counseling of the patient is also absolutely <laughs> paramount here, yes. because if you calm them down, the BP will come down yes. a bit. So, so sometimes we do that. We give them Fortwin and Phenergan and, and sedate. They need to sedate yes. the patient so at why risk. Why exactly does this happen? Yeah. So there was an article in Hemodialysis International on in interdialytic hypertension written by Dr. Madhukar Mishra. And what they said is that these patients go over the top of the Frank Stalling, which is why they go in failure, though they have blood pressure. And blood pressure is a mix of cardiac output and systemic vascular resistance. So the systemic vascular resistance is going up, and the cardiac output is falling because of the afterload, which is why the patient goes in pulmonary edema. So you increase the UF, is what they have given in such a situation, and the patient will move back over the top of the, the curve into the area where cardiac output is increasing with venous return. Patients, do we still use the, uh, yes, if the pre-dialysis potassium is okay, we need to explain him that to reduce the potassium intake, and it is a good drug to use. Yes. Basically, colonic excretion so also matters. That's what has been mentioned. Yeah. Even under. Uh, under yeah. Aldosterone, giving, uh, giving them mineral corticoids, mineral corticoids managing those patients. Pre, One of the pre -dialysis people are saying yeah. the pre-dialysis potassium is persistently <laughs> 8. Such patients you are not able to monitor, then you can document uh, hypocortisolism and you can use uh, mineral corticoid, you can reduce temporarily. But again, using mineral corticoid for long, you are inviting trouble because of one is accumulation of fluid, second the counterproductive of cardiac fibrosis and vascular fibrosis. So short duration is okay. So long duration, again, we need to think. In this patient of hypertension, NTG is the yes. best and labetarol. I have used Depin also, which is not recommended. Actually, not will hit me. More than uh, NTG, <laughs> nitroproside. <laughs> but nitroproside is even yeah, better. But, but I, I have used Depin because in this is, if it happens in a, a nice big hospital like Nadiad and KM, it's okay. When it happens in, in a small unit, you are in all sorts of problems. That time, even Depin helps. Get the blood pressure down. That's the most important. So we come to the 